651, so yet another plane now has uh, disappeared coming out of Malaysia. This time it's Air Asia Flight 8501. Uh, my next guest was in Malaysia during that last disappearance, Flight 370. Uh, Ken Jenkins, an aviation crisis consultant, uh, KenJenkinsLLC.com. He's also a former, the manager, uh, former manager of the American Airlines Customer Assistance Relief Effort Team. Ken, great to have you here. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, this is, uh, now you were in Malaysia last time around. And uh, now, I guess last time it was even more mysterious. How, do you, how are they handling? How do they handle it differently now that uh, the, you know it's not a complete disappearance? Well, it, you know, that's interesting the way you phrase that because actually they're doing Air Asia is doing the same things Malaysia Airlines did. They they just are more cohesive and. Um, they're more cohesive in their approach. Mm -hmm. They quickly set up their toll-free number for family members to dial into. They very quickly established an operations center for family members for briefings at the board point of the accident city or of the uh, where the plane took off, right. and then the off point where it was scheduled to land. But t tell me this: I mean, how, what do you do? And there's no wreckage, right? And uh, right. and you've got family members who are holding on to hope. How, what right. do you actually do in those situations? Well, and, and whether it, you, you, we're in a time where they want, as you said, they haven't found the wreckage, but the family members want to be as close as possible as to where the aircraft may be. And obviously they're not going to go in, into the sea to be there, so they're going to go to the nearest location, which is the board point of the flight, and that's mm -hmm. where most of the family members are. And the most the airline can do at this point is to provide them regular updates as they receive information have them in a location that is secure from the general public and the media, and provide them with services such as child care if they had brought their children maybe to the airport, spiritual care for those that want it, and creature comforts like food and beverage and access to phones and whatnot, computers, right. to call their families and keep them abreast of what's going on. So, what, so, so when you're dealing with the families, because you've dealt with this directly, is, mm -hmm. is there real grief at that point? or How are they really dealing with, with a situation where there's no wreckage? It varies from family member to family member, but I think what you're going to see and, and what I've experienced in the past and, and what I've seen, particularly with the Malaysia Airlines accident or event, 370, there are people that have already decided that the plane is gone and and others that are holding out hope. If you put that on a spectrum, you know, one that says, yes, we think the plane has crashed, another one that says we're not sure yet, and then you have all of the emotions that range within that spectrum. So the airline and all of the responders that are there taking care of the families are probably working through that whole range of emotions um, until they, that, that determination is made that the plane is gone, right. they find the aircraft, and they return their loved ones. Now, I read that one of the officials there in Jakarta said that, quote, that the hypothesis is that the plane is at the bottom of the sea. Now, that's, is that a fairly um, certain thing he said he, for him to say at this point in time? Well, from from what I've I've and I've followed this very closely over the last few days is today it seems that there was some information that was shown a a screenshot of the AT, the uh, air traffic control uh, radar that showed the aircraft on the radar which you can actually track on your on your own internet browser mm -hmm. uh, aircraft even in the United States today but and it shows the flight number the airspeed and the altitude that the plane was in um, or was at, and whether it was climbing or descending or maintaining its altitude. The screenshot shows that the aircraft was climbing, but it was climbing at too low of a speed. The question is whether or not that screenshot is authenticated or not, and no one has come forth to say that it's correct, that it is authentic. If it is authentic, then it could be an indicator that the plane was in some kind of problem at that time when the cockpit had called ATC, asked for a higher altitude. They were told no because there was traffic above them, there was an aircraft above them, right. and for some reason the pilot chose to ignore that uh, answer and chose to climb anyway. And that caught, you think the climbing caused a problem then? Um, I, you know, I don't know. I'm not an accident investigator. Um, you know, I, I do know enough to say that, you know, if they were climbing and they were at a, at a low speed, that could certainly bring them into a stall, which could lead to an uncontrolled roll. Right. And um, well, I, we don't know. With, we don't with, know with 370, point. you know, uh, the coverage was unbelievable, right, for months, just 24-7. Right. Do, do you anticipate the same kind of thing to happen now? I, I don't, and, and I don't simply because the the – 
the call from the cockpit with regards to the altitude change, yeah. the weather certainly indicates that this weather was a contributing factor. The location where they were flying is much smaller. It's still large, don't get me wrong, but right. it's a lot smaller than where the Malaysia Flight 370 was. I would be surprised if this aircraft isn't found within the next 48 to 72 hours. You know, it's, uh, I guess in this case, too, there was no distress call. Um, well, what do you make of that, the fact that we don't actually hear the pilots reaching out and saying, look, we're, we're going down here? Well, you know, at that point, if they feel that they're going down, um, they're, they're doing everything they can to handle that aircraft and maintain control or regain control of that aircraft. Mm -hmm. I'd rather personally that they were spending their time doing that. And, and the family members, when they're worth talking about their loved ones, are they, are they asking you then about what their last moments were? Do they try to imagine what, what that must have been like? or? There are, you know, and again, it's that spectrum, and I hate to say that, Michael, but it's true. There are many family members that will want to know what would it have been like, what would it have felt like. Mm -hmm. um, and this, of course, is going to be um, once the aircraft is found, there's a determination made of what caused the accident, which could be months down the road. But there will be family members that will ask those questions. Mm -hmm. They'll want to look at the remains of their loved one if it's indeed a fatal accident as it's anticipated this is going to be how, how do you um, how do you answer that especially if you know that you know there was a, a a plane hurtling to the ground and there must have been you know a lot of fear at that moment well and i'm, I'm very fortunate that I, I haven't had to do that in many cases at this briefing area that we were talking about earlier the medical examiner coroner or someone in that capacity in that role will meet with the families to explain the condition of the remains. Mm -hmm. And they do that as tactfully and compassionately as they can. At the same time, they also know that people can handle the truth. They, they want to know what happened. Right. Um, and then the individual decision to see the remains is left to the family. Right. And then, of course, the medical examiner or their funeral director can always refuse that. And then that becomes... A, a discussion between the family and the funeral director about, at that point. Uh, about a minute left here. So you were in Malaysia during Flight 370, that disappearance. Uh, why do you think we're seeing now two of these uh, incidents coming out of Malaysia? Well, you know, and trust me, that's not lost on me. I was like, seriously, another aircraft in Malaysia. But when, if you study any kind of, of um, trend of aircraft accidents, if you look back in the United States in the 1990s, for example, mm -hmm. a major carrier in the U.S. had eight accidents within 10 years, and they're still flying today. And 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 those kinds of questions, you know, is the United States aviation, you know, safe? Is the system safe? Came about. I think we're seeing that kind of bad luck or coincidence mm -hmm. here. I don't think it's an indicator that Indonesia or Asia is an unsafe location to fly. It's Ken Jenkins, aviation crisis consultant, formerly with American Airlines. His website, KenJenkinsLLC.com. Ken, thank you very much. Michael, thank you. Uh, and that is it for us on a Monday. Michael Cohen, producer Mike Peterson. We are back tomorrow. If you have any comments, Questions, any ideas for us to follow up on, send us a quick email, ccrecap at gmail.com. Have a good night. Talk to you tomorrow.